you, and uh, hopefully it's good for you to see each other after the first couple weeks of students and heat and all that good stuff. Uh, hope you're having a good time as you begin uh, your semester. Um, we're going to try some things uh, that we have needed to do for a long time, and that is recording this. I'm, I'm camera shy, I don't like that, but that's okay because uh, there's people who are not here who would like to be here and, and have access to what we're doing, so uh, we'll do our best to make that work. So Connie's back there doing that. And Leah, I think you've met both Leah and Connie. Leah's helping us connect the people at regional centers and people who are between classes and can't make it here, so it's easier to enter uh, at, in their office or at home. Um, some people are studying at home. So we do have a good group here, so I'm glad that you're here today. Um, let me pray for us and tell you what we're going to do, and, and we'll go forward uh, tonight, this afternoon. Lord, thank you that uh, you know, we do get to gather. Um, I think it's uh, such a privilege in the middle of uh, the craziness of life at this institution to know that we've got friends who are uh, walking with us and there to support us. Uh, it's good to be uh, together with people who have begun this journey with us, and so uh, I pray for this uh, class of 2014, that APU faculty, that uh, this would be a great semester for them and, and a good year ahead. And I thank you for the chance to spend time with them and, and look forward to learning from each other, having good conversation. And uh, we do invite you to be present and to uh, be our teacher uh, as we seek to learn some new things today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so there's a stack of stuff for you there. And uh, we're going to go through some of that. I'm going to get you talking to each other a bit. Let me give you the sort of big idea today. You'll remember that I gave you that uh, competency checklist. And it was interesting to me to sort of tally and see where this group is overall. And overall, we're in similar places. That is overall. There are some people who have uh, some experience and, and sense of competency in one area or another. Uh, but overall, there's not a lot of difference. Um, so that's kind of neat. We get a lot of um, uh, chances to kind of begin at some, some same places and to get a sense of how this is going to work for us. So, I decided to go ahead and continue with the, the second competency. Last time we did a, a definitional competency of faith integration. This is the disciplinary competency. So this has to do with the ability to engage in uh, academic faith integration with a passion for, an understanding of, and the disciplines, the discipline specific questions, connections, opportunities, challenge, habits of mind, practices, resources, all that stuff that's available to us in order to achieve unique discipline-oriented objectives. And so we're going to work on that today. It will probably show up in other sessions as well, but that will be our focus today. So I'm going to take 15-minute blocks. And 15-minute blocks will involve a little bit from me and then uh, some conversation from you. Uh, we're going to start by some conversation around the article that uh, we sent to you. I hope you had a chance to look that over. We're going to talk about some dispositions for faithful disciplinary engagement. Uh, four orienting questions, introduce the scholar competency, give you just a taste of that, and then uh, talk to you about a year-end project uh, that I'm going to invite you to participate in. So in your notes on that first page, there are some questions about this article that I sent you, and let's just, <coughs> let's just put it out there. Some of you may not have had a chance to open this and read it. I'm hoping there's at least two, maybe three, at a table who have. Uh, who can uh, share some things with each other. So if you need to shift and shuffle your tables here uh, in the room, do that. And uh, if you're online, I invite you to have conversation with each other uh, as well in that virtual environment. And I'll give you about a four minute warning, three or four minute warning when we're gonna reconvene. But just begin to talk out of the questions that I put on that front page, what most inspired you, et cetera, et cetera, uh, at your tables. So this is a time for dialogue, okay? We're ready to go. <laughs>
let's uh, let's hear a few highlights from around the room from your conversation. What were some of the things you talked about or came up or were helpful to, to some of you as you listened to each other? Let's do some collective conversation for just a couple of minutes. There's some of your thoughts. So the comment here is that uh, it, the, the salt and pepper kind of approach, condiment Christianity, right? Got a little on top there, so I've got it covered. Uh, but that's not necessarily an integrative approach, right? So proximity is good, but we're aiming for something with a little more depth. Great insight. Yeah. Other thoughts? I know our table talked about um, a little more complex than we initially thought, and then. Um, we talked some about the four approaches to the integration of faith and learning with the Cosgroves uh, outline those four things. So we talked about that. Um, mm -hmm. Good, good. Those are some key things. That, one of the things this, I like about this article is they brought together a lot of what the conversation about what faith integration is uh, and put them all into one place. So it's a good one stop, and then you got the bibliography to be able to, to go find these things. Uh, on this, this particular article. So, all right, one other thought from around the room. One other concern or question? Um, um, well, my concern is the, the whole idea of um, teaching from your worldview of Christianity um, makes me sort of apprehensive. Is, is, is my worldview Christian enough? Uh -huh. um, it automatically makes me wonder. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So APU hired you, so the answer is Yes and no, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, are any of us done with that? No. But this university does a pretty good job of making sure that those they bring in have that kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I'm confident of that with you, and I'm confident that you'll grow to know more and figure it out more and more as, as time goes on. So, yeah, take confidence in that. Okay, let me go to this uh, first presentation then. Uh, I'm calling this Dispositions for faithful disciplinary engagement, and I'm going to invite you to use your imagination for a few minutes that I want to share with you, and go back to one of my favorite stories in the life of Jesus, uh, that strange, unique story in the Gospel of Luke, uh, when Jesus was a little boy. So you remember this, you see this picture? Does it bring it back to your memory about Jesus? And here he is um, with those religious leaders, and I won't read the whole thing, 12 years old, they go to the feast, where is he? His parents go back to the temple, and when they did not find him, they go back to Jerusalem. After three days, they found him in the temple, uh, standing among the teachers. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his insights and his assertions, right? So here's this, this little boy and proclaiming amongst the great leaders, and it's, it's sort of um, absolutely impressive. It's impressive, especially when you think Jesus was a junior hire, right? I mean, he would have been on a skateboard. You know, rolling around town. How, how did he get back to Jerusalem so fast on his skateboard? And he's gone to an academic conference, basically. I mean, here's the bearded ones, the, the degreed ones, and he's surrounded by these old people with all this knowledge, and yet there's something amazing that happens there. Now, I have to confess, I'll confess right now, that I have uh, changed the wording and left some things out of that amazing Luke chapter 2 scripture. Some of you may have noticed um, and I think this picture actually is a better representation of what's happening there, this picture. So what's different right off the bat in this picture than in the other picture? It's in color. Okay. Oh, <laughs> he looks older. He looks a little older, right? Because he's pretty, he doesn't look like 12 years old in that first picture. He looks more like 6 or, or 7, right? That's more of a 12-year-old. So okay, that gives my imagination more of a flavor of this. What else? It's different. It's more like a real conversation. It looks more like a conversation, because what's he doing in that first picture? He's 
proclaiming. proclaiming. Yeah. Right? He's got his finger up in the air and he's proclaiming, right? Um, there's something else that he's doing differently here. He's sitting he's down. He's sitting down, right? And the passage actually says, so I've now been more true to the English representation of the text. After three days down there, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. So we as Christians are like that 12-year-old Jesus in this great world of scholars, right? These, this this, this uh, enterprise of academics where there's all these people who sort of look down at us because of their presumptions that we don't quite have it at the level that they have it and that, that uh, we don't really belong in this game and we can feel like the hobbit, the little one amongst the big ones. We can feel like the 12-year-old, the little one amongst the big ones. But, but what I think this little story illustrates, uh, and as we use our imagination to think about what Jesus is doing there, I think it gives us some insights on how to begin faith integration. Faith integration, uh, as Jesus hung out with the, the religious scholars, He's doing these things. He joined them in their world. So there he was in the temple courts in their world. He sat among them. He listened to them. And he asked them thoughtful questions. And I think this to me gives us a, a great way to think about our call to be teachable in the larger uh, uh, academy and the particulars of our discipline uh, where people are having these kinds of conversations. So I grew up with my mom and dad saying the best ability is teachable. I really appreciate that. I found this online. I haven't studied it to know whether it's got you know, validity behind it, but I like it as a picture because I think it's unfortunate that, that um, Christians too often in the larger culture come across over here, right? That we have the answers and those other folks don't, and then we're perceived as arrogant, and of course we're not in a position to learn, and, and yet, a lot of people then actually believe that we're here, right? And it doesn't give us that chance to, to offer perspectives, to engage in conversation, because we're not teachable. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think the Christian community has earned that, that reputation, even Christian scholars and educators in, in various places. I think that's changing. I think at APU, we're committed to see that changing, to being in that place of teacher-student, that place that heightens our potential. Uh, to engage our disciplinary colleagues and learn. So how does this translate, then, uh, those things that Jesus was doing for us in our work? Um, I think it begins with engaging our discipline on its own academic turf, right? Not come over here because the Christians are the ones with the answers, but to go to where they are. And that could be physical through conferences. That could be through collaborative uh, scholarship. Uh, that could be through, of course, what you do every day, read books, not just the jesus -y books. I'm preaching to the choir. I know you're committed to these things. Um, but reading the, the things that come out of the discipline in that we show that we believe there's something to learn there. Furthermore, that we take that humble posture of learner, that we learn well the insights and opinions of the founding thinkers, leading voices, as well as the significant presuppositions of our field. So this is Jesus listening. Uh, asking intelligent questions of the discipline, the practice, and of the literature that exists, and then be ready to demonstrate our understanding and our answers. That gives the kind of credibility that as Christian scholars we believe we should have. It's right for us to have that in the academy. It is. Uh, but this is going to be, I think, the way to do it. And it has to do with beginning to connect uh, with those who are informing our disciplinary conversations. So if I could give it four, or I guess five, uh, sort of virtue-ish words, four words, five words, that define the kind of person who does that. It requires on our part effort uh, to, uh, to go where they are and to, to not assume that our eight resources here are the way to, to understand something, but to appreciate the, the large uh, literature, to, to approach it with humility. Um, this listening thing, so I'm calling this active intellect. We call it active listening in interpersonal relationships. The active intellect, listening for deeper understanding, that sense of discernment that can ask thoughtful questions, right? Don't you love it when you're around a student who's like, wow, how did you know to ask that question? And uh, 
I think our discipline expects, us, expects that of us, and they should. And that will then give us that chance uh, to embody wisdom. So uh, I mentioned an orientation to you, and you may have heard about it even since then, the book by Ken Baines called What uh, Great College Teachers Do. What, the college, what great college teachers do, something like that. What the great college teachers do. What's called? Best college teachers. Best college teachers. That's right. You've given that book away. To Many people. times. Uh, best college teachers do. And uh, he makes a big deal throughout the book of this issue of questions. He says the best teachers have an unusually keen sense of the histories of their disciplines including the controversies that have swirled around them, and that understanding seems to help them reflect deeply on the nature of thinking within their fields. And you know it, you're, you are here because you're committed to this, but we need to be those kinds of teachers who know our disciplines well, are not afraid of the controversies, are thinking about ways that that might engage our faith. And that's what uh, the Jacobsons from Messiah College uh, have said in their book on scholarship and, uh, and uh, faith. Individuals who hope to be truly excellent Christian scholars will have to work at developing the natural connections that already exist between their faith and learning. I think we could put the word discipline in there, their faith and their disciplines. They will need to carefully explore those connections through self-reflection as well as conversation with others. Now one of the things I've uh, put in your notes, uh, it's uh, later uh, and it's just for fun, is a handout that looks like this. Uh, it's from a book by uh, William Isaacs on dialogue, and uh, some of you may have seen this, I think this is really a great unpacking of the difference between uh, defensive uh, approach to conversation and dialogue. And this to me, I think if we just tease this out, is a model for faith integration. Uh, we want to move uh, to a relationship with literature and with ideas and with practitioners that moves us to generative kinds of dialogue uh, with our fields. And so I put that in there for you with a scripture from Luke at the bottom for fun. But with that, I want to invite you to have that first discussion that's uh, in your notes. It's on the second page. And uh, this discussion has to do with the questions of our discipline and how those questions elicit in you other questions that may uh, be oriented uh, on the basis of your Christian faith. So if, and I don't know that it'll be talk about question one and then talk about question two. It might be sort of a package to talk about those two together. But if you take another uh, few minutes, five or six minutes, to highlight some things at your table around questions in your discipline, that uh, your discipline is asking, and what questions this leads you to ask of your discipline from a Christian faith perspective, okay? So I will give you a, a two-minute warning, that we can go ahead and begin some conversations with each other. So one of the things I want to say at this point is perhaps obvious to most of you, but it's, it's something that should be said, and that is that uh, faith integration does not make you a Bible teacher. Well, not most of you. <laughs> we, have, we have an exception. <laughs> and we're glad we have Bible teachers here because they support the rest of us in our work of faith integration because they're helping train the students uh, to think biblically, and to think Christianly, and to think theologically, and to think historically. And they bring that into our classrooms, which is a great gift that APU offers us in terms of the overall educational experience. But it's not about sprinkling some Bible on, right? It's, it's about integration. And so you are first what you are in terms of your training and your practice and your expertise. And that's what you're called to bring, uh, which means being an expert in that area is what's most important. So then the question always comes up, do I have to be some kind of theologian to do faith integration at APU? Well, if you're a Christian, you're a theologian, small t, because you're thinking about God, you're interested in God. And we're not asking you to be a trained theologian like the people who are working upstairs in the, in the School of Theology and in the seminary. Uh, but we are asking you to grow in your ability to think as a thoughtful Christian person would. But it comes by paying special attention to that area that you're committed to and are passionate for your area of academic discipline. Let me uh, then give you these four orienting questions uh, that are what we uh, ask of people in the faculty evaluation system. Now, I found this great picture, and I, I like it, because it illustrates that uh, if we don't get clear on what the target is, and so I'm going to put the target as the faculty evaluation system, uh, then that creates confusion and frustration. And 
And so why not, on the first day that we're together in the fall, uh, to make that as clear as I can so that it orients you. Now, I want to say this, too, because it's not just about... Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's not just about um, passing uh, uh, you know, a, a required uh, essay kind of thing. Um, these orienting questions, I think, should orient your work. Uh, not just prepare you uh, to, to achieve the success that you want on the paper that we ask people to write. Um, so I want us to think with the end in mind to get this common view uh, of what the university is interested in from you. And so I have uh, cut and pasted right out of the handbook some pages, and I gave them to you. So you have them in that handout. Uh, two pages that list uh, the description for what we call the FERC, the Faith Integration response paper. So not this year, not next year, but the following year, you will write your first FERC at APU. And, and it involves four basic questions. They come in two parts, and I want you to see them here, and then I want you to just look over that those notes again and talk to each other a little bit about uh, how this applies to you. Okay. So the, the two parts, the first part is a conceptual understanding. We're asking you to be able to provide some uh, commentary and explanation for how you understand this idea of faith integration in your discipline. That's the first question. You see there it says, uh, as defined in section 7.3.1. That's where it is in the handbook. I shared that with you a couple of weeks ago, a month ago now, uh, when we were in orientation together. That's our short definition of faith integration. So based on your work, how does that work itself out for you? How do you understand what this is and why it's important for you? That's the first question we ask people to address. The second two, are uh, those mirror images that are not the same uh, and getting at something from different perspectives. So the first one is getting at uh, how your faith informs your understanding or practice of your discipline. So this is where, with, with the analogy of lenses, you know, glasses, you put on uh, the Christian faith lenses and you look at your discipline and what do you see because you have a Christian faith set of lenses that may cause you to see it differently than somebody with a different set of lenses. Question three is the reverse of that. It asks you to put your academic discipline lenses on and to look back at the Christian faith. How does uh, what you have been entrusted to as a stewardship of knowledge from your practice, your experience, uh, your professional experience, your study, your, your doctoral degree, your master's degree, how does that help you to see Christian faith, practice it, uh, make sense of it in some unique way because of what you have? And this is an absolutely exciting question when the light bulb goes off for you on this. It's that thing that says, this is why I studied this thing and, and was involved in this profession for so long. I love this, and this frames how I view what it means to be a Christian. And maybe some way that has to do with concepts or thoughts or theories, or maybe the way we live and practice in the real world. So for me, for example, one of the examples on this is, uh, is I'm a, I'm a, P, I have a PhD in leadership, and so I study leadership theory ad infinitum and all the things that surround that. So when I go to a church, I'm interested in what's happening in terms of leadership. And I'm watching the pastor and the, the leadership team, and I'm watching how people follow one another here. And I think to myself sometimes, if I could spend a few minutes with that pastor or that leadership team, I've been entrusted with some insight that might be helpful to them in terms of a functional uh, church uh, organization. I have something that can give me insight into understanding how the Christian life might be lived out in a special kind of way. So you have that too, and it's particular to you. That's what question number three is. Sometimes, I will tell you, people think of question three as part two of question two. More of the same, but it's a switch. Do you see it? Do you see how it's different? Really, really an exciting kind of way to think about it. The fourth question is that second part we call practical application. And here we're asking for you to talk about what you are doing in your role as a faculty member to bring this conceptual understanding to life. You're a scholar, you're a practitioner, you're an educator, you're a teacher. How do you actually attempt to do that with your students or in your scholarship uh, or in your, uh, in your practice? And so that's uh, what is unpacked there in that second slide that I have in front of you. Okay? So I would like you to uh, go ahead now and have some conversation about this. You'll see on page two, presentation two, uh, those two second questions that I gave you. What is one way the Christian faith does or might inform your discipline or area of practice? And what is one way your discipline or area of practice does or might inform the Christian faith? 
And out of this, I want to just invite you to, uh, if you have any questions of clarification for me, to bring those uh, so that we can get those on the table early on. But this will be a chance as well to kind of get some insight into each other's passion areas and interests in terms of bringing faith and, uh, and uh, your scholarship, your discipline, uh, into dialogue. Okay? So I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll, I'll bug you again. So what uh, comments or questions do you have? Maybe a question for me in clarifying anything here uh, that came out of your conversation with each other. Interested in things you heard from each other that might have uh, inspired you or things that I might be able to clarify. Connie, take names, because it's clear to them. <laughs> Thank God. Right? Fourteen people, I don't have to worry. <laughs> I think it was really inspiring to hear um, my colleagues talk about just uh, one piece that came to mind. Everybody, was, everybody has something that came to mind, and I thought it was really interesting to hear them articulate it. Um, yeah, that was, that was really cool. See why I love my job. <laughs> yeah, that's what I get to do. Yeah, I agree. Good. I'm glad that was inspiring. It is inspiring. I thought for me it was easier to look at how faith could inform the discipline rather than the other, the other right. way around. So I haven't really grasped that. Okay, good. No, thanks for your honesty in that. And I promise you when the light bulb goes off, it's like, wow, you know? So I sat with a faculty member um, who really had trouble with this, and brilliant person, right? Published and, and uh, taught at a much more prestigious university than APU and felt called to a Christian university and all that. And uh, said, you know, I just can't see why that's important. I'm a Christian first and God first, right? Where's the signs? God first out there somewhere. And, uh, and that's the way I'm, I'm oriented, to see things from the, from the perspective of the Christian faith. And I said, well, tell me about why you chose to study what you study. And, uh, and he went off and started telling stories that brought tears to his eyes and tears to my eyes because there was a lot of very personal and professional passion built into it. And he studied deeply, and he wants to change the world. And I think, do you think followers of Jesus need to hear this passion of yours? Yes, they just don't get it. I said, that's question number three. You know? uh, he began then to articulate a way to make sense of it for the people that he goes to church with and the folks at APU and other uh, people of faith who, uh, who need the passion and knowledge that he has. And it, and it, it made, he, talk, he looks at me now and then he says, question number three, you know, because it reflects his passions coming together uh, in a deep way. Um, some have felt, uh, uh, with question number three, that this uh, compromises our, our God-first commitment, right? But I say that God gives us uh, kinds of stewardship, and that that uh, stewardship um, is a reflection of putting God first. And uh, so, so uh, you'll, you'll come to get this. As you think with the passion of your discipline, and how that can serve or make <coughs> sense of things in the Christian community. Uh, it's, a, it's a passion bursting kind of thing. I, I'm sure even in this room, uh, people could give testimony to. Anything else you want to clarify or, 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 or note from your comments? So I have the opposite problem. <laughs> For me, I'm a cognitive psychologist, so yeah, yeah. I have an easy time seeing how my discipline, uh, I guess, informs and helps my faith. Okay. I have a harder time figuring out how my faith informs. Yeah, yeah, my there you go. So, right. so, <laughs> Ironically, that one, uh, yeah. there are some people, and in certain disciplines, in part because of, and I think in science, broadly speaking, that's often yeah. uh, the case because of the nature of the scientific method, and it is what it is, right? As we, as we do our research and make sense of the, the natural world and the things that God has made, and so that will come to you, and I'm sure you have a lot of it in you, and I'm sure it's bubbling. Yeah, that's the great thing about these conversations is they uh, invite us to learn from each other. Okay, okay. So keep those questions nearby uh, for your own personal development as well as for um, for a little essay you get to write in a few years. Okay, let's talk about the scholarly competency just briefly, and I want to do that by uh, uh, checking with you to see if you had a chance to find an article. I challenged you to identify a topic 
in something you're teaching uh, in one of your courses or more than one of your courses, and then to go look for uh, a, an article that might be helpful in faith integration. Did anybody get a chance to do that? And would you share with us uh, the name of your article? And we'll kind of hear a few around the room and, uh, and talk a little bit about this and the use of these kinds of things. Anyway, Daniel? You got one in your hand? Well, not in my hand, but I Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I saw Dan had one in his hand. Yeah, so, but, yeah, Mike, you go next. Go ahead. I haven't read it yet, but it's uh, That's fine, yeah. Artificial Intelligence and Ethics and Exercise in Moral Imagination. Okay, cool. So artificial intelligence is an area of interest to you, right? It's a class I'm teaching. Yeah, yeah, right. So you're doing so, it. Yeah, so it's, it's very relevant to this idea of can you create intelligence? Is that a moral thing to do? What kinds of things can you do with it that are appropriate? What things are inappropriate? So how did you find that? Uh, Maybe you already knew about it, but what was your sort of process to discover that? I went to Google Scholar. Yes. <laughs> so right <laughs> on, right? Artificial intelligence guy. Like something moral. It could be as simple as that sometimes. Google Scholar put the disciplinary area of interest and Christian faith, right? Or ethics or Christian ethics or something, or Jesus or theology. And you might right there uh, find a whole page or three of possible helpful things. I went old school. Uh, Flannery O'Connor's essay, The Grotesque and the Catholic Writing. Okay, yeah. I teach writing and it talks about uh, the notion of writers of faith having a particular, should they should have a particular sensitivity and then the ability to write about the grotesque because it is such a, um, it is a prefigured condition that we deal with. So, and that's something I like to try to bring to my writers for that notion. So, should. so you knew that was out there. Is yeah. it a collection of her essays? Yeah, yeah. Mystery and Manners. Yeah, great question. Right, everyone, scientists and Peacocks and everything. Right? Yeah. I mean, this is a great example of how a discipline can inform faith, Flannery O'Connor, right? Because here's a person, if you don't know of her, I'm going to say very little, you can talk to Michael about it, but she appreciated the horrible as a representation of grace. And Christians tend to distance themselves from the horrible. They don't want to go near that. They don't want to touch that. That's somebody else's territory. And that she, as a literary scholar, writer, invites us as Christians to pay attention to that. And so here's a Christian person who's bringing some, at least she would say so, Michael and others might say so, some corrective to how we think about God and the Christian life and grace and such. Right? Great examples. What else? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a long title, but it's Philosophical and Religious Influences on Social Welfare Policy in the U.S., the Ongoing Effect of Reform Theology and Social Darwinism on the Attitudes Toward the Poor and Social Welfare Oh my gosh, five times fast, say five times fast. It's a long title, but it's, it was a good article it's, and it was really relevant to my class, so I was happy to find that. Right, so how did you find it? I found it, like, just going through the library and doing like an advanced search. Okay. So I actually found it over the summer because I was, I really am trying to get the students to think, like, see how social policy has been developed because of a faith perspective mm -hmm. and religious influence on that um, and kind of challenge some of their Right. That, oh, so. great. Yeah, good. And that somebody got the conversation started for you, right? Yes. And it like, allowed you to kind of put out there, people are thinking about this. Yes. This is one of the things that's important about this idea of informed reflection that we talk about, is it's then not just you who are concerned and interested in this, but there's people out there, and here's a stack of these people. Is that a co-authored thing? Or yes. Yeah, better be with that long title. Right. So, yeah. so, so good. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. This is a very short title. It says, what does it mean? That's a lot shorter than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trade. Well, they all trained to be a Christian academic by Derek Jones. Okay. Um, this was written by a research scientist who talks about being a Christian and being a scientist at the same time. Because yeah. that's not possible, typically, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what they So say. this is what I'm going to be presenting in faith integration. This semester, um, this was given to me by the teacher that I'm teaching. Okay, okay. Who's that? Okay, great, great. Good, good. So you have a friend who gave it to you, right? That's great too, a colleague, right? So look for friends and colleagues who've already done some of the homework for you. So you have a good? Yeah, I have a book. It's called a book. Um, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. Oh, and I have not read any of it. Okay, books. okay. Um, but I was talking with someone that's in my small group in my church. He has a chemistry background and a theology background. Mm. And he said, I have the perfect book for you. There you go. So I'm borrowing cool. this from him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to read it. Yeah. 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 Ye
If you, if you find one, you're wanting to underline more than a third of it, right? You have to get your own one. <laughs> That's great, another great example. There are things out there uh, that can serve us. So sometimes people ask, uh, what are we asking for in terms of scholarly or academic materials related to faith integration? Here's uh, four kinds of things that are not outside of what you already do in your field, probably, but it's written by a scholar in the field. Now, there are lots of things, and we're going to talk about them over the months and year, year to come, uh, thoughtful, worthy things not written by scholars, per se. But I want you to know that with a little hunting, um, I believe that there are scholars out there who've written about the thing that you're interested in. And one of the fun things that I have is, is putting out the challenge. If you say to me, there's nothing close to my area that's been written on in a faith integration kind of way, I'm going to take that challenge, and I'm going to join you in trying to find some things, okay? So we're looking for people who, from a scholarly perspective, and using appropriate research methodologies, and around the room, research methodologies are different, right? If you're working with preparing uh, uh, nurses, you're a nurse educator, that's a different kind of research methodology than if you're working with people in literature. Uh, or, or, or science or, or school counseling, right? So what is the appropriate research methodology written according to scholarly protocols and consults reasonable authorities? This is nothing different than what we're asked to do as educators in an institution of higher learning. Now, they're out there. Those kinds of things are out there. They can be found with some hunting. But we'll also talk about the kinds of things that might be on the periphery of that and, uh, and work on that. So how do you, how do you um, make sense of these? Let me just give you a quick thought on this. Uh, there are sources that provide explicit integrated insights. In other words, the work has been done for you by this writer or writers, right? They did integration and there it is. And these are the things we love because, you know, it's there. Somebody did the thinking for us. But I want to challenge you to also look for books that are focused on Christian faith, uh, articles and things, things that are focused on your discipline, and then look at my little note that's going to come up. This is where you get to do the integration. You get to be the one to sort of struggle to see how these things might come into dialogue with each other, and to uh, and to appreciate uh, the, uh, the the challenge of, of, of sorting through uh, thoughts from a Christian perspective, or or insights on practice, and thoughts from uh, the disciplinary perspective. And you might find that in the integration leads you to agreement. Uh, between those perspectives, uh, or something richer, or something new, or maybe your faith will be challenged uh, in, in some kind of way, or your discipline will be challenged. And uh, that's what the chance is to bring these things into conversation. Okay, I'm going to skip this for now. I'm going to tell you that next month I have invited, she hasn't said yes yet, she said, uh, she said let me know, I, I would love to come. I've invited Michelle Spalmer. Does anybody know Michelle yet? Of course, uh, Todd does, in the Theology Library, to talk about an amazing thing that she's done for us as faculty over the last couple of years and putting some lib guides together uh, related to faith integration. So I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'm going to invite you to come and to uh, hear from Michelle uh, next month uh, about some of those kinds of resources. OK, I, uh, this summer, did a survey of faculty who had been sitting where you've been sitting in the last uh, three or four years while I've been involved uh, in this role. And I asked them to tell me the things that they appreciated and things that they wish would be different. Uh, about the uh, new faculty orientation. And one of the things that came through um, that I took note of was that folks felt like they needed uh, an objective to aim for in their first year in faith integration. The, the conversations were nice, handouts were helpful, uh, resources and all of that, but, but what is this um, taking me towards that will help me actually experience professional development in this area? So I'm going to invite you to, to do a little project uh, that I think it can just become a part of the rhythm of your life, not a big extra thing, okay? So let me see if I can unpack this for you in our final few minutes together. I want to encourage you to uh, develop a portfolio using these uh, four steps, collect, reflect, select, and project, okay? And uh, this, I, this, this suggests that, that we're intentional at providing a place, so here's my collect slide, and these next slides are in your handout so that you've got these. Uh, an online kind of folder of sorts uh, that is on your desktop, call it whatever you like, Faith Integration Portfolio. And this can be a place 
to, to just dump stuff. Just anything that you think might be relevant to you, just put it there. It might be an article you downloaded, like this one. It's, you've got a PDF of the one that, uh, that you found. Uh, stick it in there. Uh, maybe uh, you develop an assignment um, in your syllabus. It's defined. So stick that page of the syllabus in there. Uh, you write a three-line response to an article or a book that you read. Uh, this Galileo and other myths, right? So put a little paragraph describing what was helpful to you, put it in there. And just that kind of collecting place. Um, eventually then you want to get to the place where you can uh, reflect on these things. Now you may not reflect on all of them. When you go back and open up that folder, you might say, there's things in there that, you know, actually, I'm not, I'm not used that, it's not been helpful. Um, there might be things that didn't go well that you should reflect on, right? And you, you did an assignment, you thought, this is the greatest faith integration project, I'm so proud of myself, and you do it and it just doesn't work. Well, why didn't it work? So reflect on that, write yourself a paragraph or two or three. Uh, you remember the critical incident questionnaire that you heard about last week? You can do that with uh, faith integration reflection. You can say, you know, when in this assignment did I feel like I was thriving and, and faith-related insights were developing, and when in this assignment did I not feel like I was thriving and faith related insights were not making sense to people. So however you want to do a kind of reflection. I put student feedback up there because uh, it is nice when we have students say encouraging things. Uh, that is not the whole story though. Students uh, may be encouraged, but it may not have been on target in terms of what you wanted to do. So sure, collect those, but reflect on those. Um, look for the deeper uh, insights that you uh, found your way to as informed by some of your reading. In the articles that were just shared, in, the, in, in, your, in your experience in the Bible, in conversation with one another. So that's the reflect. Then eventually, and now we're getting closer to, to the three-year mark when you'll be writing a paper, when you say, okay, well, what of this collection of things should I choose? Or if you're not a donut hole person, maybe you're a farming type person. Uh, which are the best of the best here that I want to then put into uh, my, my paper and into places where I'm then ultimately going to project. I'm going to tell the story uh, about my conceptual understanding, uh, those three questions about my practical application and the examples there. Um, what kinds of sources have you collected and what kind of reflection have you done and what kind of sense have you made of that uh, that could go into, into this, uh, this project. So, so that's a, you, you might have another way, and you might have a, a whole another way of, of organizing a portfolio. Maybe you want to organize it by classes in, inside that whole. Maybe you want to organize it by those four questions um, that I gave, those four orienting questions. Maybe you want to or, organize it by uh, research interest areas that you're focused on. So you make it work for yourself. What I want to ask you to do is to come back in April with a one or two page description of your portfolio plan. Now, it should be easy to do because if you get started on that now, then you're underway. And the next year is sort of tweaking how that's uh, gonna be a service to you during your APU career, um, a portfolio that allows you to collect things. And so when you share this with us uh, in April, include what you were able to incorporate in that first year. What kinds of things found their way into your portfolio as you began collecting and as you began reflecting. And then the second thing is to write a short uh, description of your own plan for competency development. So by the end of our time together, you'll have heard more about each of these faith integration related competencies. And uh, I'd like you to say, well, here's what I think I might do. I'll read uh, two books a year or go to a conference on Christianity and my discipline uh, or try an assignment in each class or or uh, shadow a, a colleague who does well in faith integration. So there might be many different kinds of things that you could choose. Um, I'm encouraging you at the front end here to be intentional about that for your enjoyment of it as, as a professional and for uh, the ongoing um, work that we're called to do as, as a part of this university. So, so what do you think about that? Does that sound reasonable? Um, you know, I, I always tell my students, you know, check with me when you see a number because it may not mean anything. If, if what you end up with is three pages or one page because that's what works for you, that's probably fine with me. I'm more concerned about it being meaningful to you than I am page numbers. So that's, don't let that distract you. Uh, but is there anything you might add to this or things you want to clarify on this? So basically, 
this is going to be mostly um, academic faith integration because that's what we're all doing. You're not talking about when we're out in our discipline, like if I'm a nurse, how I would integrate it into my practice. It's more related to the actual teaching here. Right. It's a good question. So if you're just being a nurse, right, that's not this. But if you're being a nurse who has students walking with you and you're in clinicals, right, and you're debriefing, then yes, absolutely, that is a part of that, yeah. So in the same way that, you know, folks around here might have other meaningful kinds of uh, things that they engage with uh, for, for income or for hobby, we're interested in the focus of our assignment here. Those things are relevant probably because they're part of the wholeness of who we are, uh, but the precise uh, intent uh, is to focus on our role as a faculty member. That's a good question. Could, couldn't there, the, Paul, also, also maybe be something from the clinical practice that informs the way we think about doing our discipline, and that would be applicable, right? Yeah, yeah. Like if it's something, like I'm just thinking about I work as a clinician, so I mean, there's things that happen in the therapy room that I can't duplicate, obviously, in the classroom, but they change the way that I think about doing aspects of psychology or, you know. Absolutely. So where it can be off the edge and maybe not helpful is when it's just stuff that turns out to be inspiring to students but not instructive to students, right? right. Yeah. So the professional who comes and says, I had a client or a patient or a student in my professional work before I was here or maybe even while I'm here, and uh, I prayed for them, and they came to Christ, and they led the whole family to Christ, and the whole city came to Christ, and well, that's inspiring, you know, and don't not tell your students that. That's good news, but that doesn't necessarily provide some instructive insight for them. Um, we could say the same thing about your scholarship, right? So it'll inform your scholarship and practice does, especially people who are in practice-related things. Um, but if it's just, you know, oh, I did, this is good. So that's where to kind of keep it in the balance. It doesn't connect our scholarship and our teaching in a way that's meaningful. That's helpful. And do people also use this for their research? Um, so, yes. you know, I had a grant and I wasn't really thinking about, you know, asking people about their faith, but then decided to do that. That could be yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, and that might be another folder in the folder. There might be a teaching folder and a scholarship or research kind of folder and a practice folder, right? And how practice informs in these kinds of ways the rest of it. Um, so yeah, and all of that, that that ties to what we're expected to do as professionals here could serve that absolutely scholarship and teaching and stuff. Okay, are we good for now then? Thank you so much for, uh, for your willingness to talk to each other and to do some preparation. So I will uh, invite you to do some preparation in advance of our times here. Um, and, and the hope is that you do a good scan of something that I might send so you can talk to each other about it and, uh, and uh, make it a meaningful time that we have together. So keep in touch if there's anything I can help you with along the way, then let's do that. Uh, look forward to our next time together. Have a good afternoon.